Hello and welcome to the Discriminating Gamer, the Andre the Giant of board game review shows. If Andre the Giant were five foot five inches tall. Ladies and gentlemen, today we're going to go ahead and take a look at 1754, the French and Indian War from Academy Games. In 1754, the French and Indian War from Academy Games, four players, of course, take on the roles of the various combatants, various factions in the French and Indian War that took place, of course, in North America. It also took place in Europe and around the world as the Seven Years' War, the world's first true world war. The game board depicts the North American Atlantic coast from the British colonies up through the uh, French-Canadian colonies, and essentially it's color-coded. So you kind of have the red being the British colonies, you have the purple being the French colonies, and then of course you have kind of green areas that represent kind of the uh, Native American lands. Now the four factions in the game are you have of course the French regulars, the French Canadians represent one team, then on the other side you have the British regulars and the British colonists representing the other team. You also of course have Native Americans. Now 1754 is the third game in the Birth of America series from uh, Academy Games. This of course follows on the uh, 1812 Invasion of Canada and 1775 Rebellion. It's the same basic game system but there are a few subtle differences. Now, you set up according to how the board tells you to, where you place the cubes on the board. <clears throat> now, with regard to reinforcements, however, you have tokens. Uh, that is to say, the, uh, the French Canadians and the British colonists have tokens. They have little, two little cubes on them. You place uh, Each side gets two of those. You place two of those around the board. Certain card events may allow you to flip those up to three cubes, but essentially, that's what you're doing. Is you're placing those markers on the board where your armies are going to come in later in the game. Now, also, for the British and the French, you come in at ports, and these, these harbors are kind of new developments in these game series. They're essentially spaces where you can place cubes themselves, and that is kind of where your British and French units will spawn from. You can conquer them, just like regular places, but again, you're trying to, of course, uh, use these primarily as reinforcement areas. If ever you completely overrun your, area, your enemy's reinforcements areas, guess what? They can't reinforce. Now, also, you do have uh, forts in this uh, game. You have forts that are kind of have a background, which means these are forts that begin at the start of the game. But then you also have places that potentially can build forts throughout the game. So you place fort tokens on them. More on that later. Now, essentially, the game works like the other systems. The first phase is reinforcements. You place a number of your cubes in the appropriate uh, spawning areas. Usually I think it's four cubes in the appropriate spawning areas. And from there you go on. Now you draw a hand of three cards from your deck and every player has their own deck. And your decks of course involve movement cards and event cards. Movement cards tell you how many armies you can move and how far you can move them. And events are just kind of random things, like, well, certain historical things rather, that will trigger, that will allow you to, to uh, uh, have kind of fun and kooky events occur in the game. Movement cards allow you to move armies. Now, an army is any number of units on your side of, 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 of you and your friend uh, that also contain at least one of your color. So you want to make sure if you're the British regulars, you have to have at least one red cube in there in order to move it. They have to be of your color. Native Americans are on the board, and again, how you get Native Americans to ally with you is you simply move your cubes into a Native American area. The Native American uh, space now becomes, or rather the cubes become part of your army. Now, at the beginning of every round, you draw the big cubes from a bag to see who goes first. When you draw, of course, your color, then you go first, or, you know, any of the other colors, they go first. But when you draw the green Native American cube, essentially what happens is you look at where it is on the track, and there's a certain symbol. There are at least two symbols for that uh, symbol on the track everywhere on the board. That means you're going to place three Native American markers in each of those areas. 
Now, when you move units, of course, you bring your units and any units that are part of that army into battle against your enemies. You all roll the dice, assuming you're all represented there. Now, your dice do different things. Now, the regulars, of course, can only roll a maximum of two dice, but they're more powerful. And the French Canadians, the British colonists, they can roll up to three dice, assuming they have that many cubes, but they're less powerful. The Native Americans, if you have any of them with you, they, of course, roll as well. Now, whenever two sides enter a battle and they both have Native American allies, you remove the Native American allies on a one-for-one one basis. So, essentially, if one side brings in two Native American allies, one side brings in three, you would both eliminate two, and the side with one uh, remaining Native American ally gets to roll one green die. So, essentially, when you're rolling the die, if you the, the defender always rolls first. The defender rolls first, uh, and it's not simultaneous, so any hits are taken off immediately. Now, when you roll the die, if you roll a target, you kill one of your enemies. If you roll a flea symbol, then one of your people actually flees to the fled box. And then, of course, if you roll the blank side, that means it's a command decision. You have the option to retreat one of those units. Now, assuming any of your enemies survive that, then they can go ahead, they can roll. You go back and forth until one side is eliminated, or they have retreated, or they have fled. Now, if ever the area into which you're attacking contains a fort symbol, the defender gets to roll a black fort dice. A black fort dice named for Sir Jameson Blackfort of the French and Indian War, who was the great hero. It's, 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 it's just a fort that happens to be black. It's... I'm always trying to impress people by knowing things. Let's let's yeah. not forget that yeah. historically the awesome. French and Indians won the French and Indian War. And that is why we're all speaking French and Indian today. But anyway, you're going to roll this black fort dice, and if it, the fort symbol comes up, which is a 50-50 chance, then the defender can ignore one of the attacker's uh, hit uh, die rolls. Now, the goal of the game, the objective of the game, is to get these victory cities. You can see these little stars that represent the victory cities on different places. Uh, one of them, I think, is the Lu around Louisbourg, has two of them. And essentially, whenever you conquer one of these, be it in a Native American area or in your enemy's area, you place one of your victory tokens there. Now, the game plays, of course, you, you've got the three cards. You can play the movement card. And then, of course, you can play as many event cards as you want. At the end of your turn, you drop to three uh, cards. Now... At some point, you're going to play your Truce cards, which a Truce card is a movement card that's generally a good movement card. But once you've played the Truce card from, from both uh, players on your team, uh, both of those factions on your team has played the Truce card, the game ends at the end of that round. So again, whoever, if you think you're in an advantageous spot, you can try to work it. If you've got a Truce card in your hand and your, your opponent, or your rather your, your ally does, you can both play those, hopefully, before your enemy can get too much further along. Whoever has the most victory tokens on the board when those truce cards are played from the same side will win 1754, the French and Indian War. So, uh, I gotta tell you, as I say, this is the third game from the Birth of America series from, from Academy Games. I loved 1812. I thought 1775 blew me out of the water. So, again, I'm thinking, okay, well, so what is this game going to bring to it? I mean, I, I didn't see any way you could top 1812, and then 1775 did it. So I'm thinking, is 1754 going to top 1775? And how will it do it? Well, it's got, again, these kind of some of these new things. you got the fort dice, which is pretty cool. You've got the harbors, which is pretty cool. And then you've got the kind of the reinforcement tokens, which is pretty cool. Now, of course... The objectives with the victory tokens is, is also kind of a different spin. It's more like 1812 than it is like 1775. Um, but these are essentially the basic differences. Some of the card events, of course, are obviously different. They're historical. And I really love it when, when, when historical games really can throw in a little history lesson here and there. All of these games do that, and I, and I really appreciate that. Uh, I'll just tell you right now, 17... 1754 is a fun game. These new mechanics work generally very well. Uh, I enjoy this game a lot. It's a very fun game. When I look at the series as a whole, though, I have to tell you my favorite game of the series, hands down, is 1775. It remains 1775. To me, I thought that game worked the best because I like the area control. We were trying to get all of the colonies. Um, I like that best, and uh, to me, that that worked well. I thought I, I, I actually enjoy uh, the the. Um, the theme of the French and Indian War in 1812 a lot. These are kind of lesser-known wars that I've actually read a lot about, and I enjoy learning about them. Um, but for me, there was something about the theme of 1775 that was, to me, a little more compelling, made the game a little more dramatic uh, for me. Um, 
I, I really enjoy 1754, however, on its own merits. I do like the harbors and, and some of these other, other, other things that come into play. But again, I just, I got to give the, the Golden Chalice to 1775. So enough for comparisons. 1754 on its own merits is a brilliant game, and you will love it. If you've not played the others, this is a fine one to jump into. Um, and, you know, if you have played the others, I definitely recommend playing this one. Like I say, 1775 is my favorite, but this one is still very, very, very good. And at the end of the day, it's just fun. It's a fun game. And what I love about these games, and, and, and is here again in this one, and that is the uh, negotiation. You've got the negotiation between the um, between the players on, on a team, the allies. And I love that. I love that so much. It's so much fun. So friends, this is a no-brainer for the Discriminating Gamer. All these games, games are great in this series. 1754 is no exception. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to say, buy it. You're going to like it. Thank you once again, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us today on The Discriminating Gamer. As always, we ask you to please leave a comment for us on YouTube, on Board Game Geek, on our Facebook page, or on thediscriminatinggamer.com. We ask you to please like us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and follow us on Twitter. We are The Discriminating Gamer, and if you are interested in the French and Indian War, perhaps you'll be interested in the following book titles. A People's Army, Massachusetts Soldiers and Society in the Seven Years' War by Fred Anderson. The Crucible of War by Fred Anderson. Betrayals, Fort William Henry and the Massacre by Ian K. Steele. These books and more are available at your local library. Please somebody help me on my feet again. And I don't know where I'm going and I don't know where I've been. Please somebody help me on the solid ground. It's a long time and I'll be dying. Once a year I wind up in the band. Quand je t'ai petit, quand je vais douze, treize ans, j'ai voulu être un homme. Mais aujourd'hui, j'ai travaillé dans Doug Smith Super. Mais, mais, j'espère être un prof de l'histoire.